Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day, and before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's episode is sponsored by Arc Silver Gold Osmium. They offer personal service and often the lowest price, period, with no minimum purchase for silver, gold, platinum, or osmium. Arc SGO is available to discuss precious metals by email, phone, or in person at their retail location in Jackson, Wyoming, and they are committed to providing the best prices out there and making sure you get the best value and lowest premiums on their wide selection of products. Go to arcsgo.com and contact the owner, Ian Everard, at 307-264-9441 or Ian at arcsgo.com, and make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. And today's guest is the former CEO of Sprott U.S. Holdings and the CEO of Rural Investment Media, as well as an expert on commodities, which is why we love having him on the show. Rick Rule, welcome back. Jesse, thanks for having me back. I enjoy this process. Yes, as do I. And it has been a while since last time we talked. So I wanted to start with your current views on the broad market. Do you think it's in a bubble right now? And if so, how bad could it be when it bursts? Is it in a bubble right now? Uh, The answer is, I don't know. I'm not an economist. There is a lot of cash on the sidelines uh, and liquidity often drives markets. Because I'm at my core, a lender, a credit guy, a green eye shade guy. I joke that I've correctly forecast 17 of the last three declines. The consequence of that is I don't listen to myself too much anymore. I have also learned on the other side, Jesse, that if you buy the market, uh, buy a sector, you go broke because it's too broad for you to understand. If you buy individual companies, using fundamental analysis, and you buy people uh, based on their values and their work ethics, you do well. So it sounds like I'm avoiding the question, but the truth is I'm discounting my ability to answer the question. Uh, There are plenty of things about the market in the near term that scare me because I scare easily. I'm a lender. (laughs) Uh, I don't understand some of the valuations, even despite the growth. I am nervous about a recession. There are companies that do well in sectors that I don't understand, and I don't allow myself to do things that I don't understand. Looking at the other side of the equation, the longest uh, unbroken bull market in history is the ascent of humankind. There have been some pretty ugly punctuations, things like World War II. But I suspect that one must be a long-term optimist while maintaining enough concern and enough cash, frankly, that you can weather periodic events, um, which is what I try to do. Well, that leads to a follow-up, which is, you know, over the past decade plus, the mantra for retail investors has often been to just dollar cost average into an index fund, into an S&P 500 fund, maybe diversify with some bond exposure and kind of set it and forget it. This is the random walk down Wall Street theory where fundamental analysis doesn't really work and nor, nor does technical analysis. So just invest in the market, sit back and forget it. Now, I've spoken to several guests on this show, people like Grant Williams, who have said that the paradox has kind of changed now. It's it's no longer a market environment where you can just passively sit back and invest in an index fund. Would you agree with that? Do you think the market environment has fundamentally changed? I think if you have a 20-year horizon, you can do it. I think if you have a five-year horizon, it's very difficult. When I look at the S&P 500, what it really is is an S&P 10. Uh, The concentration in the S&P 500 is so geared to world-dominating technology companies and my own lack of knowledge uh, around their technology pipeline is so profound that I don't have the courage personally to buy the S&P 500. In 1982, 
recognizing my own shortcomings uh, as a general market securities analyst, what I decided to do was make most of my general market securities portfolio consist of one stock, Berkshire Hathaway. The idea that I or many other people that I knew could uh, outthink Warren Buffett was very low. And the fact that Warren Buffett was able to structure Berkshire Hathaway as an insurance company rather than as a closed-end fund, <clears throat> which meant that he could deduct uh, anticipated policy loss expenses against current income, meant that I had the best stock picker in the world, and I paid an effective tax rate of 11%. Uh, that type of analysis is very different than got a hunch, bet a bunch. But it worked for me. <laughs> uh, there are years when the broad market did better than I did, but it did it with extraordinary risk. And I've decided that you can take away part of my upside if you take away most of my downside, which is why I did Berkshire Hathaway and why I don't do the S&P 500. Uh, the S&P 500 as a bet on the ascent of humankind isn't a bad bet. But it's a bet where I don't think that the information is disseminated well enough, which is to say there's a whole bunch of people out there who know more about Microsoft and Apple and Amazon than I do, and I don't want to compete against them. That makes a lot of sense. I, I wanted to get your take on both the U.S. and global economy as well. When you look at them today, what are the main points of concern for you and what, if anything, makes you optimistic? We hear a lot of doom and gloom these days. So I'm wondering if there's anything you see out there that has you positive. Let's talk, start with the optimism first. Um, technology. Uh, the ascent of humankind <clears throat> is sort of approaching warp speed. The ability, as an example, and I'm not going to give you all the arm-waving stuff about AI, but the idea that with the increase of computer power, that you can analyze really vast amounts of data and look for coincident anomalies means that securities analysts like me, who used to have to, to spend 56, 50 or 60 hours uh, a quarter doing very broad stock, stock screens themselves, can now to go to Bloomberg and Bloomberg will scan the whole universe of publicly quoted markets worldwide and give me the screen in 90 seconds. Bloomberg for $2,000 a month saves me 20 hours a month, which is astonishing. And the ascent of humankind is really being fueled by technology and the benefits of this advance in technology are cumulative and compounding. Uh, for all the faults I find in American culture, as an example, it's still a place where uh, a, a group of youngsters can take over a garage in Sunnyvale, California, and out pops Google <laughs> or out pops Apple. <clears throat> the second thing that makes me bullish is advances at the bottom of the pyramid. We have done a wonderful job in the last 40 years of moving a billion and a half people out of dire poverty to the point where they're just poor. Does more need to be done? Absolutely. But what we've done is spectacular. Uh, and I think that we will eliminate dire poverty within 20 years. <clears throat> this isn't just good from a philosophical perspective. It's good because the inclusion of a billion people into the marketplace makes everyone who cares to become richer, richer. Uh, and also exposes us to the talents of a billion people that otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to contribute. Uh, this parenthetical garage in Sunnyvale, California, then, <clears throat> might actually pop up in Lagos or Jakarta or Sao Paulo. Uh, thinking about the young people that I mentor through Students for Liberty, now 160,000 of them worldwide, if you visit with these young people, it's very difficult to be a pessimist. The third thing is simply that there's so much liquidity. Um, now, let's look at the downsides. Uh, liquidity is different than solvency. Uh, on a global basis, our societies as collectives owe too much. 
and the real test will be, will our individual genius and tenacity overcome our collective stupidity? In just the United States, we owe $34 billion on balance sheet at the federal level before state and local debt. But more importantly, through things like Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, federal government pensions, military pensions, the net present value uh, of our uh, off-balance sheet liabilities, entitlements, exceeds $120 billion. Oh, I'm sorry, trillion. I, I, I got the wrong starting point. Trillion dollars. So collectively in the United States, before individual, corporate, state, and local debt, we owe $150 trillion. And we're trying to service this with a budget that's in deficit $2 trillion a year. That's ugly math. And uh, our faith in government, our faith in collective coercion is increasing <laughs> rather than decreasing. Uh, that bothers me a lot. Well, let's get into the commodities portion of the conversation. And I'd like to start with gold hitting and sustaining all-time highs, as you've pointed out in nominal US dollar terms last time we spoke, very important distinction. Um, what do you think has led us here? Is this the result of record levels of central bank buying? Are more investors looking for a safe haven in the face of ever increasing government debt, a combination of all, all these things or, or something else entirely? Give us your take here. I think the increase has to do with three things. Uh, first of all, a bounce back uh, in market share. The market share of precious metals and precious metals related assets in the US market is below one half of 1%, down from a four decade mean of 2%. So part of this is a reversion to mean. But US consumers by and large, US investors aren't buying gold. Uh, the outflow of gold from the ETFs tells me that gold doesn't have a place in the public imagination in the West. Uh, I've learned by grading 80,000 portfolios over six years from around the world, that the gold constituency is a traditional constituency. When I talk to investors, which I do in India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Brazil, China, uh, even young investors and particularly female investors, there's a very strong interest in gold. But the increase in gold price really hasn't come from that. It's come from central banks and governments objecting to the weaponization of the US dollar and understanding, too, that pay, being paid a 4% interest rate in a currency where the true purchasing power of the currency is declining by 7%, that understand the bad arithmetic around U.S. Treasury securities, while similarly, uh, similarly understanding that the U.S., for all its faults, is, to quote Doug Casey, the prettiest mayor at the slaughterhouse. There just aren't alternatives for places. Well, the Indians don't trust us, and the Saudis don't trust us, and the Russians don't trust us, and the Indians don't trust us, and the Persians don't trust us. They still trust us more than they trust each other. <laughs> and given the fact that we have idiotically weaponized the U.S. dollar, made it less competitive as a medium of exchange, by the way, uh, the ultimate form of stupidity, uh, what we've done given the fact that these people mouth appreciation for each other but can't stand each other, is we've forced them to begin to stockpile gold to utilize as a medium of exchange, one, one that can't be weaponized. And I would suggest to you that the whole ascent of precious metals has to do currently with the weaponization of the U.S. dollar. The fact that the appreciation in gold has occurred at a point in time when the nominal interest rate has doubled is extraordinary. And it's testimony to the stupidity of the U.S. executive and the U.S. Congress. You've pointed out recently that silver is very hated right now, and you love that. Um, with gold's recent performance, silver remains far below nominal all-time highs. Central banks don't seem to be buying it, and your average retail investor could care less, at least in the West. Um, I wonder 
what is is it now the time to load the boat on silver and also going back to what you said in in the last comment about gold do people outside of the west those same investors you speak to also have more of an affinity for silver than those investors in the west no in answer to the the former question and that's consistent with prior precious metals bull markets uh, a precious metals bull market has been in my experience always kicked off by fear the silver buyer is a greed buyer. The gold buyer is a fear buyer. And the precious metals narrative uh, always starts with fear. Now, my belief is, and I think we've had this discussion before, but I'll try to repeat it briefly. Uh, my belief is that the hallmark of a retail precious metals bull market is a lack of faith in the maintenance of purchasing power in fiat currency denominated issues. I believe too that investor perceptions are set by their experience in the immediate past rather than by history. And we've been through a period 1982 to 2022 that was very benign. Lower interest rates, relatively strong US dollar, good performance in the US bond market, uh, good performance in the equities markets, punctuated by some severe but brief downturns. The consequence of that is that despite the fact that the hallmarks of the deterioration of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar abound, people aren't afraid of them yet, just like they weren't afraid in the period 1967 to 1982. Uh, it's eerie how similar that is. Uh, you might not have been around and much of your audience might not have been around, but I was coming of age then. We fought the war in Vietnam and lost. We fought the war on poverty and we lost. We tried to fight guns and butter simultaneously, and all we did was ruin our own balance sheet. It took 10 years of depreciating the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar over the decade of the 70s, when we lowered the nominal purchasing power of the dollar by 75% before we were able to afford our debts. And, and that process called gold, caused gold to go from a price-controlled $35 an ounce to $850 an ounce. The fear that fear is the wrong phrase, the concern, the affinity for arithmetic that investors need to exhibit uh, around US dollar denominated debt instruments hasn't matured the same way that it hadn't matured in the 1967 to 1982 hiatus. Uh, if it does, and I suspect it will, uh, you won't think much about a nominal move in the gold price from 2000 to 2200. You will be looking at a much larger move. Will it occur? I don't know. But I certainly think it's a contingency worth insuring against at its worst uh, and a probability worth speculating in at its best. And if you see the type of move in gold that I think is warranted, uh, because of the deterioration of the purchasing power in the U.S. dollar, particularly relative to the interest rates that are paid now, uh, I think that the move in gold will surprise you uh, in terms of its quantum. And I think if, if, that, if that momentum is established by gold, uh, what you'll see is that partway through that bull market where the narrative becomes broadly established, that silver will come ultimately to outperform gold. Well, let's shift to fossil fuels, hydrocarbons, whatever you want to call them, but a startling development, nothing, not a big surprise in a place like Canada at this point in time, but a member of the New Democratic Party there, Charlie Angus, he recently proposed to Parliament a bill known as the Fossil Fuels Advertising Act. During presenting this bill, he noticed that the oil and gas sector is killing people, and so we need to ban positive speech on the industry. And I quote, it is prohibited for a person to promote a fossil fuel, a fossil fuel related brand element, or the production of a fossil fuel. Violate this as a regular citizen and the act prescribes summary conviction and a fine of up to $500,000. It's just absurd. Violate it as an oil company and the punishment could be as strict as two years in jail or a fine of $1 million. Now, Doomberg, who shed light on this in his newsletter, thinks it will never get passed into law, but is nonetheless helping to normalize this kind of radical ideology around energy, as well as curtail of speech by governments. Um, 
I'm wondering what your take on this proposed bill is. And do you think this makes Canada more of a dangerous jurisdiction to invest in as an oil and gas investor? Does this mean it's very important to be diversified outside of that country with your investments? Three responses. The first is if the gentleman is concerned about the fact that oil companies are killing people, he needs to think about war. Oil companies don't start war. Governments do. And I would propose to him that if he was interested in a narrative that promoted life, that he should say that any mention of government, which starts war, or any mention of tax, which funds war, should be a felony or an indictable offense. And anybody who speaks positively about government should be subjected to two years imprisonment uh, or a fine of $250,000 or both. If he's concerned about life, he should be about concerned about war. And if he's concerned about war, he should be concerned about government. And his policy of prosecution and persecution should go to the cause of his concern. The big thinkers uh, in Canada and the United States and in the West, that special brand of moron, the Trudeau, the Biden, the Merkel, uh, they're the ideological successors to the Club of Rome, who were proven so spectacularly wrong in the decade of the 70s. Knowing that they can't convince their constituencies that it's okay for them to fly 1,200 private planes to Davos to tell you and I to drive less. They've decided that since we won't act in our own interest as they see it, they have to force us to do it. If they can't convince, they have to compel. And I think we have a duty at the very least to display to them what I would call the international high sign of unfriendliness, which is to say an extended middle finger. Um, I remember very well uh, in my youth a counterculture publication called The Whole Earth, the Whole Earth Catalog. Uh, and they had a play on Marx on the cover. Marx famously said, workers of the world unite. The Whole Earth Catalog had a slogan that said, workers of the world disperse. And it said under that, what if they gave a war and no one came? What if they charged a tax and no one paid? What if they imposed a regulation and no one obeyed? The correct response uh, to that member is to say to him that government is the enemy, not the solution. Uh, and that he is a mouthpiece for tyranny. Now, on, on the issue of potential risk to investments in Canada, in the oil and gas sector, do you think it's that that's maybe blowing things out of proportion um, and, and that is still a very investable country when it comes to the oil and gas space? I think it's an investable country because their geological endowment and their human endowment is so great. Uh, the Canadian government has achieved a very difficult task, which is to say they've uh, been even dumber than the U.S. government. Uh, both countries are engaged in a race to the bottom, and the Canadians are ahead. Uh, my suspicion is that what I call the consolidated left in Canada, the Liberals, the NDP, the Greens, uh, and the Bloc Québécois, uh, regularly command 60% of the vote in Canada. Uh, the Canadian citizenry seems, until they can't afford it anymore, to have a tolerance for stupidity. If you remember the reign of the prior Trudeau uh, in 14 or 15 years, he succeeded in almost bankrupting one of the wealthiest countries in the world. His successor, Jean Chrétien, who had the same political orientation uh, as his mentor, Pierre Trudeau, was forced because he had no second choice to do the right thing. <laughs> and Chrétien, of course, was succeeded by Harper, uh, while Harper, much like Reagan in our country, didn't actually 
reduce government spending. What he did was reduce the increase in government spending, which is to say that the societies are so vibrant that you don't actually have to be smart. You just have to be somewhat less stupid. And my hope is in the next election that the Canadian voter, I'm not asking them to be smart. I'm not asking them to vote libertarian. I'm just asking them, particularly the Bloc Québécois, uh, to be less stupid. Very well said. And we'll, we'll see how that works out. You know, I left that country because of this sort of level of stupidity that you speak of. Um, now, I want to switch to the nuclear sector because we were just discussing how inept governments are and how corrupting their influence can be wherever they stick their noses in, things seem to go in the wrong direction. And, you know, nuclear energy at the moment seems to be gaining more support than ever amongst the big thinkers, as, as you've pointed out, um, the Macrons, the Trudeaus, the Bidens. My issue with this is people this incompetent and some would argue, including myself, downright evil human beings, getting so heavily involved supporting and backing nuclear energy um, is there any risk to the sector here, or is their seal of approval a bullish sign for the industry moving forward? I think it's both. I mean, the idea that uh, for the second time in my life, actually, when I was an early investor in solar and geothermal, uh, I actually found myself embarrassingly being politically correct in some circles. Uh, I actually felt more ideologically honest when Biden thought my support for nuclear power was borderline felonious than when, in the oddly named Inflation Reduction Act, he decided to subsidize us to the extent of $5.2 billion. I actually felt better being vilified by him than being subsidized by him. Uh, that notwithstanding, I guess because I pay so much tax, uh, I have to be willing to tolerate some idiotic subsidy in my behalf. I'm not comfortable with it. And I think there is a real fear that because of government largesse, the industry will be co-opted, uh, which is to say uh, in our search for ill-gotten goods, which is to say subsidy, uh, that we do things because they're politically correct rather than because they are economically sound. Um, whether that transpires or not, or whether that's just the rantings uh, of a crazed old libertarian, uh, I don't know. Uh, but I am concerned about the fact that their subsidy uh, may co-opt us and cause us to do things that aren't in the best interest of our customers uh, or our uh, investors. So let's touch on uranium supply demand fundamentals here. Things are getting more interesting. We've got Kazatomprom, Cameco, and Orano all expressing an inability to hit desired production targets in one form or another. Kazatomprom, the world's largest producer by far, may actually have to buy on the spot market to fulfill contracts. With all this in mind, uh, does your current valuation of uranium equities change at all? Because I know we've had quite a run up, especially for those who had the foresight to be in the sector earlier. A lot of profits have already been made. Do the valuations change in your mind, given this um, curtail on potential future production from these big players? If you use the phrase valuations, the answer is yes. If you use the phrase capitalizations, maybe not. Uh, I, I want to draw the distinction between the short-term price that you see in the market and the long-term valuations in the companies. The cure for high prices is always, Jesse, high prices. Uh, and whether it takes a couple years, two or three years to balance that out is a very different question. It takes a long time to impact supply, as Kazatom Prom is finding out. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. No, I'm not. I'm going to pursue it. Then I'll go to what I was going to talk about. Um, we need to remember that uh, a near-term in, 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 uh, increase in price uh, doesn't increase supply because it takes a long time to permit finance and build new capacity. Uh, and each of Cameco and Kazatomprom, not so far Orano, 
has said that they won't restart the hot stopped uh, care and maintenance production until they have enough term contracts to ensure their shareholders a reasonable return on capital employed. What that means is that the spot market, while it drives investor perception, is less important in company valuations than the term market. And the term market is very opaque. People rely on the spot market because they don't have to do any work. They just look and feel. Understanding the term market requires you to work (laughs) and think. (laughs) So while the term market is all about where real valuation is created, market capitalization is created in the, in the spot market. Now, what I hope your listeners will think through is the fact that the structure of the uranium market is changing right in front of our eyes. The spot market is becoming less important in commodity transactions, in some measure because my former employer reduced the float by 50 million pounds, and the spot market is no longer a reliable source of material uh, for the reactor community. Uh, Two, uh, financing reactors has changed. We're building dozens of them, and there's over a hundred in the planning stages. This is a capital-intensive business between five and ten billion dollars a crack, And the lenders increasingly are requiring the utilities who build these plants to lock in in the term market sufficient supply that they can amortize the debt. (laughs) What this means is that the term market is is going to become more important, not less important. And the implications of that are really profound. What it means is that uranium will be the only mineral commodity that I know of where investors, Uh, and companies will be able with some certainty to understand the selling price of the commodity and hence, to some degree, the margins, the operating margins that they're going to enjoy. The gold trade, that which hasn't been streamed, uh, takes place in the spot market. So there's no price certainty. The same with oil, the same with iron, the same with coal. Uh, The longest reference that you have in the iron business is a year. With uranium, you're going to start having references with minimum selling points and stipulated selling bans, contractually agreed, uh, for as much as 15 years. And if the counterparty to that term contract is an investment grade credit, Ontario Power, Tokyo Electric Power, China General Nuclear, Duke Power, Southern companies, uh, the companies will be able to use those contracts to lower their cost of capital at the bank to build the projects. And lazy security analysts like myself uh, will be able to look at the stipulated prices going out 10 years and 15 years and do a much better job of forecasting revenues, margins, and free cash flow, which should lower the cost uh, of capital to the uranium business for a very long time. What I like to tell speculators is the easy money has been made. The increase in the uranium price from 20 bucks to 100 bucks took care of that. And the prices of a basket of decent uranium juniors is uniformly up 300%, moving from out of favor to in favor. But the sure money is ahead of us. Uh, The sure money occurs because we've never had a circumstance before where a junior like NextGen, as an example, could, I'm not saying that they will, could uh, engage in long-term contracts with creditworthy counterparties to the extent that a junior could raise the six to eight billion dollars necessary uh, to build that deposit. The fact that the junior could do it means that if Rio Tinto or BHP or Cameco wants to come in and buy that junior, they're going to have to buy it at a price that takes into account that the junior doesn't need to sell. And that's a game changer. Very interesting observations. I want to go into some more kind of general natural resource investing, and I want to start with mining jurisdictions. I'm wondering at the moment if there's any mining jurisdictions that are off the radar for most retail investors that you think are worth paying attention to. Oh, this is going to get me a lot of hate. 
uh, I made a lot of money for 22 years in Russia. And then I lost three quarters of it all of a sudden. Uh, investors who have the courage, not American investors, because they're prohibited by law, I think, from doing it. Investors that have the courage uh, and the intelligence to set up uh, accounts uh, with Sabir Bank or somebody so that they could speculate in the lowest cost, most efficient producers in the world, which are uniformly Russian, might want to do that. I can understand people who wouldn't do it for moral reasons. Uh, I can understand people who also don't want to risk losing all of the money that they have involved in Russia if that society continues to deteriorate. When I look at uh, every regime in the world uh, and I look at the jurisdiction that has the best human resources and the best natural resources relative to enterprise value, the answer comes back Russia, Russia, and Russia. Uh, that's a step too far for most people. I would do it, frankly, except for that I have a banking organization in front of the FDIC. Uh, and getting into a bun fight with the U.S. government is not something I'm particularly interested in doing. Um, the penalty for failure is much too high and I'm much too public. Um, I think that speculators now need to look at the potential of Argentina. Uh, I think the political reality is that the Argentine constituency won't have the patience to do the right thing. But I didn't think that they, I didn't think that they would elect this guy to begin with. Uh, if this guy can hold on for two years, uh, I remember the impact that right thinking can have on an economy. I remember uh, what happened in China when Deng Xiaoping said, to be rich is glorious. Uh, I remember what happened in Canada when Harper, although he didn't slow the growth of government, slowed the rate of increase. I remember what happened in the United States in 1980 when Ronald Reagan did the same thing. Uh, he did a lot of wrong things, increasing the debt, but at least he slowed the growth of government. And I think Argentina has so much low-hanging fruit that if they can suffer two or three years of pain, particularly if uh, Mele decides, as an example, to facilitate the development of the Vaca Muerte shale package in the New Ken Basin, if he decides to uh, permit things like the massive uh, silver reserves uh, in southern Argentina that have been halted by politics, that that's a constituency uh, that one needs to look at. I'm very attracted by what both Namibia and Botswana are doing uh, in terms of normalizing their mineral code, enforcing the rule of law, uh, streamlining uh, the participation of foreign investors, uh, and allowing foreign investors to uh, return reasonable amounts of capital employed on successful efforts. There are jurisdictions too, sub-jurisdictions in constituencies that people look at with more favor. Uh, as an example, the United States, Texas, Wyoming, Alaska. <laughs> the list is skinny. That's the whole list. Uh, that are attractive. Uh, and there are constituents, constituencies in Canada. I would see particularly Saskatchewan, but also perhaps Alberta that are attractive. Uh, and then there are uh, much smaller constituencies, uh, tribal constituencies in North America, the Taltan constituency, the Lakota constituency in the United States, uh, that I think are coming to the realization that they need to attract investors. Um, I think if Lula uh, doesn't succeed in destroying Brazil, that there's a strong undercurrent of social and political uh, acceptance of mining uh, and extractives in that country. And I'm not completely agnostic about the possibility that uh, there would be a political swing in the United States and Canada 
uh, I'm nervous about the direction that that political swing might take. I don't see Trump as an example, as any friend of freedom or anybody who would reduce the size of government. Uh, I see him as a transactional politician who would continue to steal just on behalf of a different constituency. Um, my hope is that a, when a return to mean, if it occurs uh, in the United States and Canada, that that return to the mean isn't a swing to the right, but rather a swing to freedom. That might be too much to ask for. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. That's what I'd like to see as well. I have a theory that if Trump wins in America, it's actually going to be bad for the Canadian elections because Canadians absolutely despise Trump. I think it would bring out a lot of voters, young liberal voters who wouldn't otherwise vote, banging the table saying, not in my country, are we going to have a conservative prime minister? Just a theory, but it remains to be seen how this all plays out. Certainly, uh, Trudeau has learned that he can't run uh against the opposition. He has to run against Trump. Uh, Trump is a gift for God, from God for Trudeau. And I think the conservatives uh, need to make this much less about Trudeau personally and much more about Trudeau's policies so that he doesn't have the ability to match his personality with Trump's personality. Uh, despite the fact that I'm not particularly fond of Trudeau's personality, <laughs> it's certainly much more benign than Trump's. Yes, yes. So you have a lesson on the Rural Investment Media YouTube channel on interrogating potential investments. Now, in it, you noted that given how few mining companies, particularly in the junior sector around the world, are even investable to begin with, the primary goal should be determined to determine which companies aren't worth your time or capital. So how do you go about doing that in terms of interrogating company CEOs or management what are the questions to ask to kind of realize, to clear it as, okay, this isn't a, an investable company? Even before you ask the question, uh, you need to vet the person that you're questioning. Uh, does this person have a track record of success? And is this track record of success applicable to the task at hand? If their track record of success hasn't so much been discovering mines, but rather moving stock, if you're a stock trader and you understand something about the greater fool theory, in other words, you're willing to do something dumb because you believe that these people will attract a whole constituency of people who is even dumber than you, then you don't have to go to the rural classroom. Uh, all it's about is does the person have a PhD in hoodwinking? Uh, I haven't been good at that. Uh, so that isn't something that I do. The expertise I'm looking for is prior success at discovery or development or production, or whatever the task at hand is. And when I say the task at hand, it's important to understand that. If someone comes to me and says, Rick, I've been a success in gold, in gold mining, and I say, how so? The person responds, uh, I successfully uh, turned around and operated a, a gold mine in Archean terrain in French-speaking Quebec. But the task at hand is exploring, <laughs> not operating, uh, a, a copper gold porphyry in 15 million year old accreted terrain in Spanish speaking Peru, while the success is laudable, it isn't probably appropriate to the task at hand. And that same uh, matching of curriculum vitae to tasks needs to extend below the CEO. Uh, it needs to extend to the chairman. Uh, what's the chairman's role? Is the chairman there to protect the CEO? Or does the chairman have some specific expertise? which will aid the task at hand. If the company needs to raise money, has the CFO raised money before? If the company is building a mine, has the CFO presided over the financing uh, of uh, a construction operation before? What were the directors chosen for? Do they have specific expertise in constituency building? If the company is operating in a Spanish-speaking company, does the CEO or any of the directors speak Spanish? <laughs> So before you even bother questioning a company, find out whether the people involved are worth questioning. Do you care what answers they give you? Do you have enough faith in their ability to answer the question? Do you care what they have to say? If the answer to that is yes, then proceed. It's important, as I say in the interrogation, to let them do their 15-minute spiel. Let them give you their presentation because they can't help it. They're programmed to do it. So push the button and let them go. 
uh, and then after that, try to phrase your question in the context of the spiel. Say, uh, I really appreciate that overview of the company. Uh, you know, while you live it, I'm foreign to it, and it really helped this introduction. So thank you for that. Uh, what I'm still at a loss for is uh, the principal unanswered question that you're trying to answer right now. In exploration, as an example, it's really a technology-based business, not an asset-based business. You're trying to explore. You're trying to unlock uh, hidden wealth, which may or may not be in a given piece of terrain. So what's the unanswered question? It might be that the data that's in front of you is that there is a mineralized anomaly that has been demonstrated by surface sampling. The unanswered question may be, does this mineralized anomaly extend to bedrock, which means that rather than just do random soil samples, that you have to do a systematic grid. Uh, it might be that a systematic grid has already been established and you need to understand the third dimension. You need to put four or five drill holes into it. It might be that the unanswered question, when you have four or five drill holes, is not do I have a mineralized anomaly, but rather do I have an economic accumulation. You ask the person, what is the primary unanswered question that you're trying to answer? What do you believe is the approximate probability of success? What do you think success is worth? What's your arm-waving target? How much money will it take you to get a yes or a no answer? What will constitute you a, a failure? In other words, what will cause you to save the rest of the money that you have in the treasury rather than drilling an idea that you've already disproven? <laughs> and by the way, after you've told me how much money it's going to take, how much money do you have? Do you have enough money to get me to a yes answer? Now, I've employed this technique, Jesse, for about 40 years. And in about 80% of the cases where I've asked the question, the person I've asked the question of said, I've never thought of it in that context which is to say their unanswered question is, will I still be drawing a salary in 18 months? And while I understand that's of interest to them, I'm much less interested in that uh, than what is my projected return on capital employed and what is the probability that, well, I will enjoy that return on capital employed. When you have taken the company through the process, in the first instance, uh, if they say, I've never thought of it, what you need to do is understand that they are parenthetically in Vancouver, preparing to hike to Whistler, and heading east. Uh, they aren't going to get where they're going because they don't know where they're going. And they've done you a real favor. You can throw them away. They may go up in price for accidental reasons, but the risk is too great for you to continue to waste any time and treasure considering them. And, and you can devote your time and treasure to companies where you have a higher probability of success. Then you need to take them through the answers that they gave you and further refine the process. Oh, okay. The unanswered question is, uh, you have all these surface samples, you've defined a mineralized anomaly, does it go to depth? Uh, explain to me in some more detail how you arrived at the thesis. Show me how the surface sampling data suggests that this isn't, um, uh, as an example, transported terrain. Uh, show me the consistency of grade in the surface sample. Show me how your thesis was developed relative to the data rather than the fact that it is convenient for you to raise money. And then when you're done that, show me how the method by which you propose to test the thesis will actually test the thesis. Uh, in other words, is the grid that you propose, which is to say 10 lines every 100 meters, uh, sufficient to test the thesis? And is the grid pattern based on the results of the surface sampling? Or is it only because you've chosen to grid the only level place on the property, <laughs> as an example? Uh, how long will it take you to get me the answer to this unanswered question. 
uh, if it should take a, a field season uh, and you're in the far north, it might be that it requires two field seasons, which means that the person who's considering buying the stock knows that they have to wait 18 months before they get a yes answer. <laughs> Uh, is my time frame as a speculator consistent with the time frame required to make money? What will constitute a no answer? Jesse, I can't tell you how many times a company's raised $10 million to explore, learn $3 million into it that their thesis is wrong, and spent the rest of the money. So what will disprove the thesis? What will cause you to shut the program down, save the money, and live to fight again another day? Uh, what is the value of a yes answer? What's your target? Uh, if uh, a reasonable interpretation of the size of this anomaly is that the target is a million ounce deposit, what you know then is that the in situ value, not the net present value, but the in situ recoverable uh, value of a yes answer is $2.2 billion. Uh, against a $20 million market cap, not all bad. But if the target is undefined or the target is small, uh, it might be that a yes answer, given the probability of obtaining a yes answer, isn't worth you speculating on. Uh, what does a yes answer cost? Let's say that the question involves drilling and let's say that the budget is $5 million. Let's say again, it requires two field seasons, which is 18 months. If the drilling is going to cost $5 million and the GNA associated with keeping the company alive for two years is $2 million, that's a $7 million need to get a yes answer. How much money do you have? If you have $2 million, you don't have enough money to get me a yes answer. If you can't get me a yes answer, why on earth would I buy? <laughs> uh, if they say, well, I only have $2 million, but I could raise the rest, you need to say, oh, okay, from who? Do they have phone numbers? May I call them to verify the fact that this money's coming? Because if this money is com isn't coming, the probability that you can give me the yes answer, which would cause the stock to go up, is nil. You follow what I'm saying? Now, even if you do this, <clears throat> you're going to be wrong in speculation more times than you're right. The lovely arithmetic of speculation is that occasionally you're going to be right for a 10-bagger or a 15-bagger. And those 10-baggers amortize a whole bunch of 25% losers. <laughs> um, mercifully, if you do this, you are competing against a whole class of speculators whose basic premise is got a hunch, bet a bunch. And those same people are basically anti-contrarian, which is to say they don't want to buy uranium at 20 bucks. They want to buy it at 100 bucks because the increase in price has validated the thesis that they were afraid to invest in when the thesis had value. So this isn't a guarantee that on any individual uh, decision that you're going to make the right decision. But if you employ the technique over a decade, uh, you will outcompete your competitors by a standard deviation. That is a fantastic breakdown. I feel like you've brought the rural classroom here on Commodity Culture. This whole conversation has been excellent. So really appreciate you joining us today. Now, I know you've got a couple of events coming up. Um, again, more knowledge from yourself and some great guests. You've got a virtual boot camp on prospect generators coming up on April 20th. And of course, the big one, the 2024 Rules Symposium on Natural Resource Investing. That's running from July 7th to 11th. Could you talk about those two events and what people can expect from them? Yeah, really four things I want to talk about. If you like what I have to say about natural resources and you want to personalize it, go to ruralinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks, and I personally, no obligation, will rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. If you want to become a better investor yourself, go to the rural classroom. There's 200 hours of instructional programming there, and it's free. <laughs> go there, employ the lessons. When you're ready to employ them, once every three months, I do a boot camp around a, a, a deep dive, an eight hour long dive on a specific to topic. We did uranium, by the way, two and a half years ago when it was cheap. We did silver. We've done royalty and streaming. Because exploration so hated, we're doing an exploration boot camp specifically around prospect generation. These boot camps are $99. We have 
eight hours of programming, eight and a half hours of programming in your own home, but you have access to the recordings for a year. And by the way, you're going to need that access because you can't absorb the information in eight hours that I'm going to give you in eight hours. I'm so confident in this product that it comes with a gold-plated money guarantee, money-back guarantee. If you've taken the course uh, and you don't think that you got your money's worth, email me. I'll give it back. Our granddaddy product, if you will, is the Natural Resources Investment Symposium. Uh, I believe we've been doing it for almost 30 years. Uh, this year's takes place in Boca Raton, Florida. Great big picture thinkers with the paradigm that you won't get on CBC or CNBC. Uh, the Jim Rickards, the Daniela DiMartino Booths, the Nomi Princes, the Grant Williams of the world. People who explain the world the way it is, not the way Trudeau and Biden wish it were. If you come to subscribe to that worldview, we have fantastic uh, analysts and portfolio managers, people who've been making money in natural resource markets for 30 years. More importantly than that, we have the living legends, the gentlemen and ladies who have built multi-billion dollar mining and oil and gas companies from scratch, telling you how they did it and how the lessons they learned can make you a better investor. Finally, at our conference, every exhibitor is vetted. Specifically, if we don't own them in accounts that we manage and own, they can't exhibit. It doesn't mean, sadly, Jesse, that every stock I buy goes up. What it does mean is that I know the company well enough that I've invested my own time and treasure <laughs> in them. And once again, uh, you can attend this conference live, which I would prefer, or you can attend the live stream uh, in your own home. And once again, you will have access to the recordings for a year after the event. And you will need to review the tapes again and again and again. Once again, a gold-plated money-back guarantee. Whether you attend live or you attend in a live stream, if you don't believe that the curriculum was worth the tuition, I will refund the tuition. I'm delighted to say in 30 years of offering for pay investor educational products, I've had to return about one-tenth of one percent of the tuitions that I've charged. Great. Well, I'll put a link to both the Prospect Generators boot camp. That's going to be on April 20th. And of course, the 2024 Rule Symposium on Natural Resource Investing, July 7th to 11th, as you mentioned, both live in Boca Raton, Florida, as well as available online. Those links will be in the description below for those who are interested. Thank you once again, Rick, for coming on and sharing all your knowledge with the audience. Jesse, thank you so much for the work that you do on behalf of your, audi your own audience, and thank you for the ability to participate in your program. Thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, this episode is sponsored by ARC Silver Gold Osmium. Visit their website at arcsgo.com and contact owner Ian Everard today at 307-264-9441 or by email at ian at arcsgo.com. And make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.